There it's Okay, it says it started. You got it? Yep, you're yeah, good, to go. good to go. All right. Still, okay, here we go. All right. Hello, everyone. My name is Gary Rosenfield. Welcome to Virtual Narcon 2021. And this presentation on the design, evolution, and production of long-burning hobby rocket motors. It's sunny and 36 degrees here in beautiful Leeds, Utah. I'd like to thank the NAR leadership and Ed LaCroix and Todd Schwein in particular for organizing and conducting this event under unusual and difficult circumstances. At the end of the presentation, I will answer any questions from the Q&A function, so please feel free to post your questions to the Q&A at any time. So let's get started. Okay, I'm gonna share my screen here. I'm going to go full screen. All right. This presentation deals with long burning rocket motors used in model, mid power, and high power hobby rocketry. In professional large scale rocketry, long burning motors are a natural result of the large size and propellant web thickness in core burning designs. For example, if you have a, a space shuttle type motor that's got a three foot uh, thick web thickness, that thing's going to burn over two minutes just, just by the nature of its size. Because of the relatively small size of hobby rocket motors, special propellants, materials, and designs had to be devised to produce burn times exceeding a few seconds. To begin, we'll discuss the early history and developmental evolution of longer burning motors for hobby rocket applications. The first hobby rocket motors were end burning designs using black powder propellant. Black powder has a relatively fast burn rate, which is about 0.7 inches a second at low pressures, and it's well suited to end burning motor designs as the end burning grain can produce sufficient mass flow for practical thrust levels. A small dimple or partial core was formed in the nozzle end of the propellant grain to create an initial thrust spike to help get the model off the pad and quickly accelerate it to a sufficient velocity to impart stability as it left the launch rod. Early large long burning black powder model rocket motors such as the FSI F7 that's shown in the photo were modified end burners with above average burn times up to about nine seconds or so. When ammonium perchlorate composite propellant or APCP motors first arrived on the scene in the late 60s and early 70s, they were all core burners with burn times of less than two seconds. The core burning geometry was a result of the much slower burn rate, generally 0.15 to 0.25 inches per second of composites compared to black powder. Composites generally needed more surface area to generate the same mass flow rate as black powder, although the propellant efficiency of composites could be two to three times higher on a per weight basis and depending on the motor operating pressure. As core burners, the relatively shallow web thickness, which is the distance between the core and the case wall, and in the case of these original early uh, core burning composites would be about a quarter of an inch or less, would result in relatively short burn times. For example, the Enerjet E24, F52, and F67. Now, I started Composite Dynamics in the mid 70s, which was one of the two uh, first companies making these type of motors after Enerjet went out of business. And shortly after that, John Davis joined the business. John was an engineer at Hughes Aircraft in El Segundo. That's a picture of him up there in the right. John had access to materials and equipment that I didn't, and he started experimenting with a number of exotic designs, including end burning composites. The first end burning composite motor I witnessed of his was a two inch diameter motor with a graphite nozzle that John static fired in his backyard. I don't remember the exact burn time, maybe five, 10, 12 seconds, whatever it was, but it was truly amazing and it really sparked my imagination. Sometime after that, John started making 29 millimeter versions of his end burning designs. 
Now, if you recall uh, from the early composite dynamics motors, we were using thin wall fiberglass casings for all the regular motors. So John would use rolled up silicone sheet, various gasket materials, or in some cases, machined down 29 millimeter paper phenolic casing material for liners. John always cast the propellant directly into the liner or gasket material. I developed the method of casting into paper tubes sometime later. The rolled up liners were made of gasket materials and had mixed results. And it became clear to me that the best liners were the machine phenolic tubes. Now at one point, John made a couple of 29 millimeter G12 size end burners using thick wall 29 millimeter fiberglass casing with no liner. During NARAM 20, that was in Fountain Valley, California at Miles Square Park, I believe, Mark Maley, who was also the founder of Small Sounding Rocket Systems, Roger Johnson, the fellow that coined large and dangerous rocket ships way back when, and I flew one at Anaheim Stadium in California in an Enerjet style 1340 rocket, and it just disappeared. I don't remember if we ever got it back. The other motor was saved and was donated to the Museum of Flight in Seattle. John later produced a 29 millimeter E9 end burning motor for sale. I also donated one of, one of them to the Museum of Flight. And if they ever get the collection uh, up there, maybe you'll see it. These motors really impressed me and I became determined to produce similar versions of these motors of my own design. Shortly thereafter, I decided to leave the Composite Dynamics Partnership. And that is a whole nother story. I developed the paper casting tube technique sometime while I was in the Air Force. John dismissed the idea as having problems with accelerated aging, which I didn't believe. Then I got to thinking, why use a separate liner if you could make the case and liner out of the same material? So I started casting propellant grains in one inch OD paper tubes and using 16th inch wall 29 millimeter OD phenolic casing, which functioned as a case and liner combined. This combination worked great. You got the benefit of a superior liner material with the simplicity of a one piece case and liner design. In 1981, I wrote a series of three articles for Jerry Irvine's California Rocketry Magazine on motors of the 80s. They dealt with topics such as history, then trending motor technique technologies, comparing various grain designs and performance optimization. In the third article about performance optimization, I went into great detail in determining the type of thrust curve that was best suited for maximum altitude performance. The conclusion was that a thrust to weight ratio of about two to one would generate the highest altitude for a typical mid-power model rocket. And going through this exercise reinforced my interest in long burn motor development. Now let's look at some advantages and disadvantages of long, -term, of long burn motors versus short burn motors, and you'll be able to see some of the trade-offs that have to be made here. So on the advantage side, rockets powered by long burn motors generally achieve higher altitudes. They generally uh, create lower acceleration and velocity, which means lighter weight airframe materials can be used. Motor chamber pressures can be lower, casings can be thinner and lighter weight. Little or no aerodynamic heating in, in terms of K motors and smaller, which I'll get to that point probably later. A higher motor mass fraction, which just means the, the percentage of propellant in the, in the motor is higher than the inert weight. Nozzle throat erosion can be very low depending on pressure and duration. And just as an example, uh, Scott Pierce built an H5 motor way back in the, in the early days, probably either late 80s, early 90s, uh, it was a 40-second a duration motor and uh, produced basically one pound of thrust for 40 seconds. He even flew one, and I guess one was also, he attempted to use one in a monocopter, and uh, there was no measurable erosion from that nozzle, but it, it also ran at very low pressure, probably below 150 PSI, and the, uh, the char layer formation must have kept up with the erosion. Now the disadvantages. Long duration motors require additional case insulation, which adds weight and reduces mass fraction. Total nozzle erosion may be higher depending on operating pressure and thrust duration. 
Case heating can quickly rise to unacceptable levels. Propellant specific impulse or ISP will suffer if your chamber pressure is too low. Rockets may be subject to gra so called gravity turning if thrusturation is too long and if there's no form of uh, thrust vector control. Limited weight lifting and payload capability and pyrotechnic time delays are much more difficult to implement in a production environment. And that's another story. Now let's look at moon burners. About 1973, a fellow by the name of Rick Bennett developed a keyhole shaped offset port rocket motor uh, design, which is shown in the upper right there, using composite propellant that was flown successfully a number of times at the Smoke Creek Desert in Northern Nevada. These were very large motors he was flying, sometimes even in clusters. In 1981, Bill Wood, independently conceived of what is now called the moon burning grain design using an offset cylindrical port. Bill tested these motors at Smoke Creek launches and I was immediately impressed by the possibilities. The G30 or G25 as it was called later was based on Bill's grain configuration and was the first motor I designed officially after leaving the composite dynamics partnership. The 29 millimeter G30, again later called the G25, used a phenolic case and a machined graphite nozzle. It used what is now known as Aerotech Classic propellant with a small core nearly completely offset to the edge of the casting tube. And in the upper right is a uh, just a typical moon burning grain showing the burn back pattern and the, and the port offset with a small web thickness left between the core and the, and the, the, uh, the casting tube wall. So in the G25, a small web was left between the core and the casting tube to provide a short initial thrust spike. I produced a quantity of G30 motors for Jerry Irvine, and he sold them under his Toy Rockets brand. A number of them were sold and flown at LDRS. And in the lower right, you see a typical thrust curve of one of these G25 motors at a very flat trace up to about two and a half seconds, and then almost a straight taper to, uh, to zero at almost five seconds. In the late 1970s, I began speaking with Bob Parks about long burning motors for the Internats team for use in the FAI S8E radio controlled rocket glider event. Those conversations became the impetus for me to develop the Aerotech E6 24 millimeter motor, which in 1982 became the first certified Aerotech motor and the first certified long burning composite. The E6 had a total impulse of 40 newton seconds and a burn time of about seven seconds. The E6 helped the U.S. Internats team win several awards at, in the SAE event in 1983. And I have a recollection by Bob Parks on the 1983 Internats that's interesting. Bob writes, at the beginning of a world championships, the team submit all the motors they plan to use in the contest. The motors are impounded by the officials and given out to the contestants at the launch pad just before each flight. The officials will also pick a couple motors at random from each batch submitted and fire them on a test stand to verify that the motors meet the rules for that event. Each team will generally have some people watching the testing. At that time, all the other countries had paper casing black powder e-motors for the event. The USA Aerotech e-motors were really unique with the phenolic casings and graphite nozzles. They were also much smaller and lighter than the black powder motors. When they were ignited, they had the clear blue flame, no smoke, and the nearly eight second long, very smooth sustained burn. Everyone's jaws dropped, and then the total impulse data came up. Both motors were about 39.5 newton seconds, the limit was 40 newton seconds max, and jaws really dropped. The weather conditions for the event were poor, a dark overcast, cold and windy, with pretty heavy rain for the last round. But the USA team swept the event with first place, Phil Barnes, second place, Karen Dillon, and third place, Bob Parks. Plus, of course, the team first place. The USA score was over double the second place Polish team. The original E6 used a machined graphite nozzle suspended in epoxy using silicone molds and a paper phenolic case. It had a rod and tube configuration machined on the end of the grain for initial thrust spike that was created by a plug cutter tool. 
The E6 was produced in three different delays and a booster version that could be used in a two-stage rocket. The user would put a short piece of thermal light wick between the two motors to ignite the upper stage. Greg Smith flew his skint rocket using two E6 motors to an estimated 8,000 feet at Lucerne Dry Lake about 1982. And the upper right is the photo of it lifting off, and down at the bottom is a, uh, a picture of an ad, and that's Greg on the left next to his rocket. Now, the F-10 was actually my first end burning design, but the second one to be certified. It was similar to the E6, but with a 29 millimeter phenolic casing. It had a larger graphite nozzle and the same rod and tube and aft end configuration. It produced close to 80 newton seconds of total impulse with a burn time of about eight seconds. Like the E6, custom silicone molds were made to position the graphite nozzle inserts within the aft bulkhead epoxy while it cured. In that picture on the upper right, you can see the graphite inserts sitting there, and there's you can't get, really see a close up of the uh, molds, but they're in there holding that in place. The epoxy for these early E6 and F10 motors had to be post baked at 150 to 200 degrees Fahrenheit to fully cure, because if you didn't, the epoxy would melt when the graphite uh, insert got hot, and they they could eject out of there or leak. For a short time in Sacramento sometime between 1982 and 1984, I was making some 29 millimeter G10 and G12 end burning motors. These used a composite two layer case of a phenolic liner and a thin wall filament wound fiberglass outer shell overwrap. They generally worked well, except that occasionally the phenolic liner which contained the nozzle or bulkhead would be ejected from the case during the burn as the bond between the liner and the case was not always sufficient. So that idea was dropped after a while. A 29 millimeter D7 and some 18 millimeter end burning D2s and D3s were also produced. For a brief time in the early 80s, Irv Waite, who was the original uh, founder of Enerjet, made the first Enerjet motors, uh, which was with the designs and, and formulas were then purchased by uh, Lee Pister of Century. He produced an E-class engine end burning motor. These were initially made for Reaction Technology, Inc., and sold under the trade name Whirlwind, but were later sold by North Coast Rocketry. They used a translucent 29 millimeter fiberglass case and end burning propellant grain based on potassium perchlorate. They were approximately an E24, and they only burned for about two seconds, and they were difficult to ignite and didn't sell very well, and a sample was donated to the Museum of Flight as well. And I have a recollection by Chris Pearson, the founder of LDRS on the Whirlwind Motors. Chris writes, Irv Waite of RDC made those. Originally, they were made for Reaction Technology Incorporated, J.P. O'Connor and Mark Weber, down in Cincinnati. After a short while, they decided they didn't want to sell them anymore and let us take them over. They were called Whirlwind Motors, and I believe they were a 40 newton second E24 motor. They indeed used potassium perchlorate as a fuel. They had a translucent fiberglass case, and you could see the case bonded propellant and a plenum chamber between the propellant surface and nozzle. They were an end burning motor. They needed a special high energy igniter to get them started, very slow startup. I remember advertising them as the first smoky composite motor, and they came out a bit before your white lightning motors were released. I believe that we were selling them in the mid 80s when everyone was still on speaking terms with Weber. We never sold many. After a couple of years, we dropped them from the catalog, and nobody complained. Now to talk about long burn getting into high power rocketry. Early high power rockets were built from larger versions of model rocket component materials, thin cardboard tubes, balsa fins, and nose cones, etc. High thrust motors would cause many of these rockets to shred during boost, and it became clear that long burn motors would be ideal for the early high power rockets. This led to the design and manufacture of the 54 millimeter I-65, J-100, and J-125 moon burning single use motors. They were introduced at an early LDRS in Medina, Ohio, and were a big hit. The Lock Easy I-65 kit was designed by Ron Schultz specifically for the I-65. And that picture up at the top is, is a, the current incarnation of the Easy I-65, and the picture on the upper right is a static firing outside my facility in Sacramento. Of a, that's either an I-65 
65 or an I-140. Both were moon burners. Uh, one had a faster propellant than the other. By the late 80s, Aerotech developed the 98 millimeter K125, L250, and M500 moon burners. These were single grain, single use motors. They had, they were 98 millimeter actually, using Aerotech classic propellant in a phenolic casing that burned for up to 20 seconds. Aerotech attempted to fly an M500 in Jim, Jim Dunlop's upscale Energet Athena, that's it in the picture, that's Jim and his Athena, at one of the first LDRS events in Hartzell, Colorado. But unfortunately, the M500 KO'd and destroyed Jim's rocket, and it was a beautiful rocket. I'm sorry, Jim. Scott Pierce flew a K125 at El Dorado Dry Lake, and it was never recovered. I also believe a, a, a L250 was, was flown at that same launch that worked. Not the, uh, not the El Dorado launch, but the, the one in Hartzell. The thick wall, uh, large diameter phenolic casing was prone to weakness and variability, and that's why we dropped it. In the early 1990s, Aerotech introduced the 54 millimeter K250, a long burning full K sync class single use motor. The K250 used a modified version of the moon burning grain concept and combined a shallow C slot with a tapered version of what is now called a D grain. The K250 burned for about 10 seconds and provided record setting performance in lightweight rockets. And Deb Schultz flew one in a 54 millimeter laser, laser lock to well over 20,000 feet at Blackrock. In the mid 90s, Aerotech introduced the J90, K135, K185, and K270 54 millimeter RMS reload kits using white lightning propellant. These were a little different in that they used a machined rectangular moon burning style or offset slot grain up in the upper right. In 2007, the RMS 38360 I-49N N burner and RMS 38480 I-59WN boost sustain motors were certified. In 2007, Aerotech introduced the M750 and later the N1000 98 millimeter RMS moon burners. And about the same time, the Aerotech M650 and M685 75 millimeter moon burners were released. All these motors were capable of extreme altitude performance due to their long burn times. The N1000 was capable of over 47,000 feet single stage, and the M685 was capable of flights over 150,000 feet in two stage rockets using a high thrust N class booster. Other companies that have produced long burn moon burning motors over the years include Vulcan Systems, DTI, and Ellis Mountain. And that background picture is from Kip DeGerda's two-stage flight that used the M685, and he went over 150,000 feet with that. In 2008, Aerotech introduced the L339, a 98 millimeter end burner in the, in the RMS 98-2560 reload casing. The L339 burns for about eight seconds and uses warp nine propellant. This is the largest end burning motor currently available to the certified flyer. And in 2010, Aerotech introduced the J99, which was a 54 millimeter end burner in the RMS 50, 54 852 reload casing. The J99N motor burned for 10 seconds and used warp nine propellant. It was discontinued sometime after introduction due to reliability issues, but it was reintroduced in 2020 using a new propellant casting tube that eliminated edge burning and so-called tunneling effects and the resulting unplanned increases in propellant burning surface area, meaning Cato. This new casting tube material is also used on the newer end burning motors. In 1993, the F-13 and G-12 end burning reloads and 32 millimeter RMS RC 3260 through 100 hardware were introduced for the Aerotech Phoenix rocket glider. Reloadable versions of the end burning D7, E6, and a mid range E7 reload kit and a 24 millimeter RMS RC 2420 40 hardware set were released in 1994. In 2013, Aerotech introduced the C3.4 and D2.3 end burning reload kits 
for the RMS 18 slash 20 case hardware, along with a plug forward closure. And in 2018, a single use version of the C3.4 was certified for the Internet's team. Now let's look at some design considerations for long burn motors. Propellant. For end burners, a fast propellant is desired to generate sufficient thrust. But for moon burners, almost any standard propellant can be used. For casing, phenolic, fiberglass, or aluminum may be used. Typically, long burn motors operate at lower average chamber pressures than center core burning motors. For the nozzle, graphite works well with low throat erosion, but has relatively high thermal conductivity of the case and other motor components. Phenolic nozzles have low thermal conductivity, but higher throat erosion, especially at higher pressures. For the liner, paper works for shorter burn, shorter burn times and phenolic for longer durations. EPDM rubber can also be used, but its fabrication can be more difficult. For time delays, it's possible, like on the current E6 and F10 motors, but it's difficult to implement in mass production. So these motors remain as sort of a niche product, low production, a higher cost. And for igniters, long burn motors, especially smaller ones, typically have very small nozzle throats, and igniter insertion and proper placement can be challenging. And resulting and the resultant success, whether you have a success or not, with, with your ignition. Now at NARCON 2018, I met Joe Barnard of BPS.space, who was working on thrust vector control or TVC rockets using sophisticated flight computers and servo mechanisms. He'd been using he had been using 29 millimeter black powder motors for propulsion but wanted something longer burning and with more total impulse. I told him we could build some long burning G-class motors for his application. This was the impetus for developing the modern G8, G11, and G12 Super Thunder motors. Initial testing of these motors with different propellants generated some interesting thrust curves and realized that most of these were intended to be flat traces and for whatever reason we got you know, progressive, regressive, uh, very strange thrust curves. Uh, in some cases, we were using, we were trying to use fast white lighting propellant, and I think the material, uh, some of the exhaust products, deposited on the throat and uh, increased the pressure. So we were, and and it wasn't repeatable. There's a couple of more of them. Uh, as you could saw, some of these motors were uh, were developing up to 20 second burn times. The picture up in the upper right is a is a long burning motor using that. A fast white lightning. Eventually, we settled on a modified end burning geometry and super thunder propellant for the new long burn motors, a formulation with a burn rate midway between Blue Thunder and Warp 9. They employed a 16th inch wall 29 millimeter OD fiberglass epoxy case and a 32nd inch wall phenolic liner. The G8 was a straight end burner. The first G11 and G12 motors had a shallow slot in the aft grain end to provide an initial thrust spike. The G11 and G12 only differed, slightly differed in throat diameter by about five thousandths of an inch. And the reason for that, as I recall, was uh, Joe was, you know, trying to tailor the thrust level to what would work in his rockets. And the G8, G11, and G12 motors were all triply certified in 2018. But shortly after certification, TMT determined they did not pass the 200 degree centigrade maximum casing temperature spec, so certification was revoked. And here's just some pictures of the motor cross sections and a typical thrust curve there on the lower right of a G12 with the initial thrust spike. Uh, the G8 has no initial thrust spike. It's really suited to, our, uh, to gliders and so on. Uh, I believe that's, uh, I can't, I don't, can't tell whether that's a G12 or G uh, or G8. I think that's a G12 uh, firing up at the upper right. Uh, the G12 at the lower left, you can see the transverse slot across. You're looking at the cross section of that slot. That's about uh, three uh, five sixteenths deep that uh, creates the initial thrust spike. So as we were working on the motors for Joe Barnard, I realized that a long burn G or H motor would be ideal for Tripoli Gerlach's hamster dance altitude competition, 
that is held annually during the Balls launch in Nevada's Black Rock Desert. So I started running some flight simulations and discovered that the performance of these designs could approach the 15,000 foot altitude ceiling of the contest when used in a very lightweight rocket. The 29 millimeter H11 and H13 motors were developed for the contest and were flown successfully in 2018 and 2019, achieving 12,096 and 13,219 feet, respectively, in minimum diameter rockets constructed from Quest kit parts. Here's uh, firings of the H11 and the uh, H13. Uh, the H11 at the, uh, the upper one had the transfer slot just like the G12, but longer. Uh, had a few few more seconds of burn time. And then the H13, uh, again, an end burning grain, but with a drilled, a uh, partially drilled core that produced a, a much bigger thrust spike for a slightly longer duration. Uh, I believe it was uh, up to about 10 pounds of thrust. Dimensionally, that case is the same as the uh, DMS H135. That's an eight inch case. And there's some pictures of, at Hamster Dance. Uh, the first one, HD8, that's uh, Chris Short helping me out uh, at the pad. Um, then the H13 in the middle and the H13 lift off to the uh, 13,000 foot flight. And we had some commercial application of the H13. Uh, 32 of the H13 motors were used in an effort to duplicate a British World War II weapon called the Panjandrum for an Adam Savage Science Channel TV show. The device actually worked pretty well and it hit the side of the target it was aimed at. 31 of the 32 motors ignited successfully. And you can see it beginning to roll off the, the trailer there. It was uh, pretty spectacular. Uh, they did it near the ocean. I believe uh, the hydrogen chloride in the exhaust was condensing, forming a lot of a, what appears to be a lot of smoke. It normally wouldn't be, they wouldn't seem that smoky. So if you recall, the initial TRA certification of the G8, G11, and G12 motors was revoked because of excessively high casing temperatures, over 200 degrees centigrade. We engaged the NFPA, National Fire Protection Association, code revision process and demonstrated through testing that the higher temperatures of long burn motors using non-metallic casings were not a safety concern. However, we ran into some political roadblocks. Steve Shannon had recommended that we find a technical solution to the casing temperature problem. I knew this would be a costly option though, and we had actually already started the process, but we would have to uh, get new casing and new liner material to do this. So we began working on the technical solution to the issue while also pursuing the NFPA code revision effort. The technical solution involved three design changes. First, reducing the fiberglass casing wall thickness from a 16th inch to a 32nd inch, increasing the phenolic wall thickness, phenolic liner wall thickness from 132nd of an inch to 116th inch, reducing the nozzle OD from one inch to 15 sixteenths to fit inside the liner. And you can see uh, in the pictures on the, on the right, there's the old design and the new design. You can see that basically what we did is we traded off uh, fiberglass wall thickness for phenolic wall thickness. But of course it required us to obtain new materials for all of them. And the nozzle had to be machined down to fit inside because uh, if you just butt jointed the nozzle to the liner, uh, it did not, we found out that did not work too well. These changes did not affect the propellant grain diameter or the nozzle throat diameter, so the motor ballistic performance was unchanged. The motor weights were reduced by a few grams, and that's because uh, paper phenolic is lighter density, lower density than uh, fiberglass epoxy. It did, however, greatly reduce the casing temperature to the point where the G8, G12, and H13 motors passed the NFPA casing temperature requirements and were all recently certified. For Hamster Dance 10, contest organizer Tom Blazanin decided that the altitude ceiling would be lifted. So we were only limited by how high an altitude one could achieve with a five pound liftoff weight, non-metallic rocket and motor. 
I set to work on several 38 millimeter and 54 millimeter motor designs and simulated their performance of an open rocket. This effort resulted in the design of the 54 millimeter K76 WN boost sustain motor, which was recently certified. But since Hamsterdance 10 last year was canceled due to COVID, I decided to fly my Hamsterdance 10, 10 entry as an exhibition flight at the Airfest launch in Argonia, Kansas last September. And that's a picture of the uh, motor cross section up there and then uh, the liftoff shot. The K76WN uses a core burning Bates grain of white lightning propellant and an end burning grain of warp nine with a total burn time of 20 seconds. And the way that the thrust gets distributed, about half the impulse goes into the boost and the other half in the sustain. The rocket, which I named Hamster Riots in Argonia, flew a bit squirrely, but still reached an altitude of 20,112 feet, which was very close to the simulation. This experience taught me the importance of accurate fin shaping and alignment of supersonic rockets. Also the use of three versus four fins to reduce or eliminate coning. It was recovered intact and undamaged about two and a little less than two and a half miles away with the help of an onboard Altus Metrum Telemetrum flight computer and GPS tracker. And I, that I can't say enough about that device. It's uh, helped me three times now. So let's look at a few uh, per performance simulation comparisons. Uh, the first is a G12 versus a G80. And these are some with some preliminary numbers in them. So, you know, you notice that maybe they're kind of off a little bit, but you'll see uh, with the with the G12, uh, we're simulating up to 10,500 and some odd feet, whereas the G80, uh, regular G80 short burn motor is less than 6,000 feet. This is in a small lightweight rocket. Then we're going to compare an H13 with an H135, and I know it says H14. That was an early prototype, uh, but uh, you can see the, uh, the predicted altitude is 13,263 feet on this rocket. This is actually my Hamster Dance 9 rocket simulation, and with an H135 uh, DMS motor, uh, we can only get 8,000, a little less than 8,300 feet, and uh, the actual altitude of the uh, the thing was, I don't know, 50, 60 feet off on the uh, prediction. Let's see, on the last, uh, last simulation, we'll look at a K550 versus an, a K76, the new uh, boost sustain motor. Uh, the K550 simulated to a little under 14,000 feet in this rocket. And this was actually the Hamster Dance 10 uh, rocket. And then the uh, K76WN simulated 20,700 feet, roughly. And in fact, the actual total impulse of the uh, K76 was less than what I was uh, predicting. So uh, it's even more dramatic, the difference. And what about the future? This kind of brings us up to the current time, current state of the art with long burn motors and hobby rocketry. Since the uh, Hamster Dance 10 was postponed at least one year, it got me to thinking about even greater possible performance. It turns out that altitudes approaching 60,000 feet may be possible with a five pound liftoff weight rocket. It all comes down to how long a thrust duration is technically achievable and if the rocket can fly straight enough during the burn. I've been working on some full K and low to mid L long burn motors that may be capable of reaching something in that range. And there's a few other contestants. Uh, we have a little uh, a hamster dance uh, page on Facebook and they've been sharing some of their designs and ideas, but some of these people have been uh, doing the same thing and they may put the rest of us all to shame. Very impressive things they're doing. So just to look at the possibilities, this is, this was one of the simulations I ran. This was a, an L, L-155. It was about 3,000 Newton seconds for 20, for 20 second duration. This simmed out at 56,600 feet. You realize how small a rocket this is. This is minimum diameter, fins on the case uh, rocket that weighs five pounds. Uh, it's only about two feet long. 
uh, 56,000 feet, almost 3,000 feet per second burnout velocity, which is, you know, which is pretty high. And you're going to get some significant uh, arrow heating, I believe, at that velocity. But that's even with a 20 second burn time. 53.5 seconds time to apogee. So now we're getting, we're not going to be able to, to fly these with Quest kit, kit parts anymore. And uh, that concludes my presentation. And uh, we'll open this up to questions. Okay. Let's see, I think we should do these from the bottom. Uh, David Snyder said, Gary, thanks for the presentation. Question about moon burners, do you have any evidence uh, that the off offset thrust that some have observed when using them? Uh, we have not actually measured offset thrust from these. It seems like most rockets, if there is some offset thrust, the fins uh, must compensate sometimes for that. Um, I think there's also the possibility that uh, uh, that the mass is loaded over to one side at some point. I'm not, that's not my area of expertise. So um, I have heard about that and there's some suspicion that there could, there could be some effects there, but I've also seen moon burning flights that have gone perfectly straight. I'm sure most of us have. Uh, Guy Gelhausen says, I've been successfully flying thrust vector control model rockets for several years now, but appropriate available motors are limited. Have you considered series of long burn plug 20 millimeter motors like, like G15 or G20 size? That would be the most helpful for us TVC rocketeers. Uh, well, we have a G12. If, if that's not enough thrust, we could, we could look at some slightly higher thrust ones. Um, but, uh, you know, we're kind of limited by um, the available thrust level that you can get out of, out of a certain type of propellant. And then if you, uh, if you go to a, a propellant that burns too fast, um, you know, you might have to, uh, might be, it doesn't just, uh, it doesn't just go in increments of one Newton, you know what I'm saying? You, you might jump to another level of thrust. So, um, we'll have, we'll take a look at that. <laughs> Matt, how are the C2 motors for international contest rockets coming along? Well, I, I, I believe, as I may have said before, uh, Carl has made some and um, he got one to work or two to work, and we just uh, to nail down the total impulse and get them get them certified. So I apologize for the delay. Kevin Stump. Back in the 90s, you made a 29 millimeter H35 blackjack, which was a favorite of mine because the propellant weight was low and it had enough thrust to keep a reasonably light weight, bigger model, low and slow. Any thought of something similar coming back? Kevin, I don't remember that motor. I, um, I just don't remember it. Um, maybe contact me offline and uh, if you can give me some more information. I don't, that, was that a, a moon burner? It had to be. It couldn't have been an end burner. Where can I buy an uh, Paul Joyce Burton 55? It's it's still under development. Um, it, it turned out that the the we were we were using a carbon fiber casing and it it's, it had some development issues and also the weight was higher than we wanted the total weight. So I've had to scale that project back a bit. Um, it'll be, uh, it won't be three, it'll be a, it'll, it'll probably be a, a, a high K motor, not a low L motor. Okay, Curtis Heisley says, are scans of your articles, trends in high power model rocket design for the 80s available? That's a great question. Um, they were available uh, on Jerry, one of Jerry Irvine's websites, but I have not been able to find them. I actually have them, but, uh, I would be reluctant to share them due to copyright rules. And I looked into that, by the way. So, um, yeah, I, I think uh, talking to Jerry Irvine, if you could reach him, would be the best option. Okay. 
Jonathan Rains, what are the next steps in the NF NFPA process uh, regarding updating case and temperatures? Um, the NFPA committee uh, heard my proposal and they wanted independent testing to go along with the testing that I that I offered. And uh, that testing is going to have to come from NAR or Tripoli or, or both. And it was supposed to have been supposed to have taken place, but it, it didn't happen in time for the for the last meeting. So um, I don't know, don't really know what the status is in that at this point. I think uh, at some point we're going to try to organize some testing uh, to to support that proposal. Dave Lewicki, Gary, do you see pyro? Pyro delay column solutions coming for long burns like the G12 and the H13. It's it's possible, but it adds a lot of labor uh, to those motors. So um, if there was enough demand, we would look into it. But the other problem with the pyrotechnic delays, the way we're doing them right now, is just they're they're time consuming, labor intensive, because you they have to be. Uh, you can't just butt a delay of grain delay grain up against uh, a, a piece of solid propellant and expect it to ignite. Uh, we have to do special things to, to the in the process to make sure that the, the the flame transfers from the propellant grain to the uh, uh, grain and using a flammable glue and all that stuff. So um, if the market was big enough, but I, I would recommend using um, right now that the electronics are cheap enough and reliable enough that uh, and light enough. Um, I used them on on my H11 and H13 rockets, and it only it didn't even add an ounce of weight to the thing. Dear Mike, will these engineering models be available at European distributors? Well, that's that's up to uh, right now. We have a, a master distributor in uh, in uh, Switzerland, Jörg Thuring, and I would uh, contact him. I think his. Contact me offline if you don't have his email address, but it's a Space Tech Rocketry if you want to look him up on the internet. John Sicker, Gary, uh, do C slots versus moon burners work better or just easier to produce? Well, the C slots, I would say, are easier to produce, but the, generally speaking, the C slot goes to the center of the grain, whereas the moon burner is completely offset. Uh, and so so you can get a longer burn time out of a out of a moon burner than you can with a C slot. But but yeah, I mean C slots are generally easier to produce than moon burners because a true moon burner you either have to cast the core with a mandrel or drill it, and the the, the slotting process is faster than, than drilling. Uh, Joyce Guzik, does the last rocket you discussed weigh five pounds with or without the motor? What kind of build materials would be needed for such a rocket? That that rocket was done, designed to weigh five pounds with the motor, so it was a it was a real challenge to, to try to tailor all the weights down. But you'd have to be using uh, carbon fiber casings, carbon fiber fins, uh, uh, probably a thin wall fiberglass nose cone uh, for that velocity uh, to do that. So yeah, it's it's a very very challenging uh, to do that. Daniel Fennell, uh, are there any plans to make fast burning 29 millimeter Super Thunder motors? They would be really fun. Uh, Daniel, yes, um, we 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 are looking at that. It's just uh, <laughs> they would be really fast. Are the G8, G11, G12 currently approved? Okay, the G. Uh, this is Robert Zurich. Uh, yes, the G8 and G12 are approved. They're certified. They will be available this spring. Uh, yeah, they don't show up in the list because they were just announced um, like hours before the uh, we. Well, now I'm trying to remember when he announced it. Um, I believe uh, Alan uh, announced those right before no, right before Narcon. So uh, they'll be on the list. The G11 won't because we just dropped that idea because. It was really kind of an in-between uh, motor, and, and the G12 does everything the G11 did. Isaac Mitchell, what is the lo lowest total impulse long-burning rocket engine? Uh, that would probably be the, I mean, it depends on what you call long-burning, but the D2.3 
is a, about a 20 newton second motor and the C3.4 is a roughly 10 newton seconds. And he asks that again. What's the turnaround time for torque motors? Uh, we're trying to keep everything in stock, so there shouldn't be much of a turnaround time. Uh, but typically, um, two to four weeks uh, if we're out of stock. Uh, Andrew Eng. Hi, Andy. Uh, how many development articles are needed to qualify new designs? Uh, it just depends on the motor. It could be uh, 10 to 30 motors, I mean, that we'll fire. Uh, and it depends on how close they are to other designs. If it's a, a, just a small increment from an existing design, uh, we, can, we can do it, in a, we can develop them fairly quickly. Rob Crisp, can you speak to how motors are manufactured and tested in general without giving away any proprietary information? Well, uh, in our case, I mean, other people do, do things in different ways, but uh, we, we mix propellant and it, it's in the, it's kind of like a thick pancake batter consistency and it's poured into our, our paper tube casting tubes. It's allowed to cure. That takes three to five, sometimes, sometimes two weeks, depending on the formulation, but typically a week or less. And then the grains will be, uh, they can be slotted and cut to length or they be, can be cut to length and drilled. And then the uh, the grains are loaded into uh, you know and most of the motors use a molded one piece nozzle case assembly. Uh, the grains are loaded into that. Uh, the bulkhead will be completed with either with an assembled delay or some, in some cases the delays are bonded inside the bulkhead. Uh, in a lot of the motors, they're screwed into the to the casing or they're dropped in uh, if they're just a non threaded bulkhead. And then uh, we'll put epoxy on the end to hold it in place. Uh, then the ejection charge and cap are put on there and then they're packaged. Ariane Nag Nagarkati. This might be a little off topic, but are there any motors that have a curve similar to this? High thrust spike in the beginning, then drops down to a certain level. Then finally at the end, there's a, a final big thrust spike. Um, there are no motors that we make currently intended to do that. Uh, you could you could do that if you had an end burner, a, a, a core modified end burner, and you you uh, left the end on the bulkhead, the forward bulkhead end uninhibited. When it burned through to that other end, you would have a big thrust bite. Because you'd have basically two surfaces burning at once. What are the, okay, Conway Stevens, what are the biggest challenges in doing upscaling to larger impulse L and above long burn motors and burning or moon C slot? It depends on the diameter, Conway, but uh, you end up with um, insulation problems uh, and, the, you know, burn rates don't scale with diameter. So, you know, just because you make the motor twice as big, your burn rate is the same. So your, your duration will be longer. So uh, I would say in doing, in doing really large motors and trying to keep, you know, without going crazy on the burn time, you have to keep bumping up the thrust, the uh, burn rates. So, you know, coming up with ways to uh, to make the propellant burn faster is the biggest challenge, I think. And then next to that would be the insulation. I'm getting near the end of my time here. What is the lowest total impulse long burning engine? I think I answered that. When will the K76s be available? Uh, Chris Irving. Yeah, Chris, we've, we've run into some production uh, issues, issues that have come up in production that didn't come up during development and certification. Uh, not motor failures, but hot spots on the motor, and we're, we're concerned about that, and we're look, looking at alternative uh, design tweaks that will probably require it being recertified uh, to make that work. We just We just don't want to, we don't want to have a marginal situation when we re release that motor. And Don Sicker, the fastest propellant is Warp 9. Propellant X is the highest ISP propellant, but Warp 9 is the fastest. 
Are there any, any 18 millimeter? Yes, there are 18 millimeter engines. Long burning, uh, yeah, they would be the, again, that would be the uh, C2 point, I'm trying to remember the names, C2.3 and, I'm sorry, C3.4 and D2.3 reloads are the longest burning 18s. Okay, he asked that question three times. Okay, I, I think that's it. Um, let's see here. And I thank you for your participation and attention. And enjoy the rest of uh, Narcon. Thank you.